Welcome to the Careers by Jen podcast, episode 292. This time on the podcast, Jen offers sage words of advice that just because you're good at something doesn't mean it should be your career. Well, obviously. I mean, if that were the case, I should have... Well, anyway... Here's Jen. Hey, I'm Jen Swanson, and Careers by Jen is where I help you to get the job, love your work, and advance your career, and I talk about wellness and success topics, too. This podcast is actually ending production after episode 300. However, you can find me over at Careers by Jen on YouTube, where I will be continuing to share career tips, advice, wellness, and success topics, and much, much more. It's been a 10-year run here on Careers by Jen on the podcast, and until we are at episode 300, I invite you to continue listening. Go back and listen to the archives, and please enjoy this show. Thank you so much for being here. Are you feeling stuck because what you are doing is something you're really good at, but you're bored, or you wonder what it is? might be like to do something else and making a move seems kind of risky? If yes, this episode is for you. Hey, 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 Jen here. (laughs) And I'm glad you are here with me today, my friend. The Careers by Jen podcast is recorded on the unceded and traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, including the Katsi, the Kwantlen, the Stolo, and the Coquitlam First Nations. I am in a few career and job search forums on Facebook, and recently I noticed a number of people asking the same question, only with slight variations. And the questions were were these ones, um, and I'm paraphrasing because I didn't copy and paste them, but, but I read a number of these in the past few days. And they go like this, I want to make a move, but I don't know if I should. I feel stuck. I'm good at what I do, and I don't know much about this new thing, so I don't know if it's a wise thing to make a move. Some of the people asking said they were in their 30s, others were older, one was younger, maybe in their mid-20s, but all of them expressed feeling stuck in some way, and some of them even said that word, and yet they were still wondering. So they were feeling stuck, but they were still wondering if they should do anything about it, basically. And what I want to say to you is don't settle. Don't settle. If there's any way you can do something that you want to do even for a while so that you don't feel that feeling of stuck because then that will lead to regret and wondering for the rest of your life if you should have and what would have happened if you did, etc. If there's any way that you can do something that you want to do, then do it because feeling stuck and like you are, what you are doing is not worthwhile or that you're missing out on doing what you really want to do and should be doing. That's all the makings of burnout, my friend. And you don't want that. You really, really don't. Becoming cynical, becoming angry, becoming unmotivated, uninspired, that is not a good way to spend the majority of your time. And if you're working a full-time job, you are spending more time at work with the people that you work with than you are at home because part of the time at home you're sleeping. And so it's a huge chunk of your life. Do you want to spend a huge chunk of your life being miserable or or being sort of blah (laughs) and bored? I don't know. You don't want that, I don't think. And yes, I get it. There are lots of considerations when making a career choice. Money, benefits, location, skills, experience. Absolutely. And no, we don't always have the option of choice. I get that. Or at least there are times when it feels like we have no option of choice. But just because you happen to be good at something doesn't make for a long and happy career doing it. How many times have I heard, well, I was good at math and my dad was an engineer, so I went into engineering. 
as, you know, an explanation of how they got to be where they are today and why they're not happy doing it. And some people are perfectly happy doing that kind of thing, but others are not. Another another example is, oh, we have a family business and I've been working at it since I was a kid and I know how to do it all, but I don't really like it and I can't imagine doing it for the next 40 years. Or I didn't know what to do so that I took the first job that was offered to me and then I started advancing through the different roles and I've been here ever since and I know the job and I'm good at it but I'm bored and there's no room to grow and it's just not very interesting. Is any of that resonating with you? <laughs> well, here's a question for you. Who said you had to stay doing the same thing your whole career? Who said that? I'm going to tell you a story here. It's a little bit long, but I'm going to tell you the story. And some of you have heard some of this. I started out wanting to be an actress when I was in high school. I spent, I was in musical theater in high school. I spent all sorts of my time in the little local theater when I was in my teens and my early 20s. I was actually part of two little small community theater companies. And I would be backstage, I'd be directing, I'd be stage managing, I'd be set decorating, I'd be on stage in different productions. Um, I, I, that was my passion. I loved acting and I loved theater. And I took improv classes and film classes and, and things. I would go to Vancouver and take classes. I'd have to take the bus <laughs> in some cases before I got a car. And um, eventually I got myself an agent and did some headshots and did a bunch of extra or what they call now background work, including as a saloon girl in a really terrible version of The Call of the Wild, Jack London's um, book, The Call of the Wild. There was a really terrible version made of it that starred Ricky Schroeder, if any of you remember Silver Spoons. I don't, he's probably been in other things, but that's the only thing I knew him from. And I was in uh, that movie for about 15 seconds in the saloon scene wearing a pink, pink corseted dress. Anyway, <laughs> thankfully, I think it's gone. I don't think this movie is anywhere. So I'm glad about that. Um, but but I didn't know what I wanted to do. And because theater school was too expensive and too far away and not in the cards, I, I didn't know what to do. I decided to go into health care. But I didn't want to be a nurse like my mother and my grandmother before me because I the blood and the guts and the bodily fluids, like, ew, no. <laughs> um, I, I just squeamish. I can't. I can't look at all that stuff. So no thanks. But I did like the hospital environment. And I liked the idea of doing something that would help people and care for people. So I went to college and I trained as what's called a nursing unit clerk or a health unit coordinator or a ward clerk. There's all different names for this role. And um, I did my practicum in a big downtown city hospital right when the HIV AIDS um, crisis was was at its heyday when when people were scared of it and people were being treated so awfully by being isolated and locked up it was just wild and before they learned how and what it was and how to treat it and all of that and the very day I got my certificate for the course that I had taken at college I literally walked out of the college drove to another big downtown hospital handed in the resume and they said, wait, do you have a minute? And right then and there, they interviewed me. And <laughs> within the hour, I'd been hired two days a week, Saturday, Sunday and Monday, I think. And, um, and so I took it, I took the job. It was, I never happened before that I was, you know, handing in a resume and I got interviewed and hired on the spot. Um, so then I went back to waitressing. So I was waitressing the rest of the week and then I was working in the hospital a couple of days a week. But my dream hospital job was a little community hospital in a seaside town nearby to where I lived. So I put my resume in there and I went back to waitressing, serving in the restaurant during the week and working the weekends at the downtown hospital. Then, not that long after, several months in, my dream hospital phoned me and I went in for an interview, and I got hired there. And so my restaurant days were over, <laughs> and I was working in the two hospitals, the seaside one and the one 
in downtown Vancouver. And that was fantastic. So my my truck stop days were over. After a year or so, I applied and got a full time job at my seaside hospital. So I gave up the Vancouver one because I was driving this ancient Ford Mustang that was supposed to have four cylinders. And I think it had two and a half by that point. (laughs) So it was a little risky driving down there. Um, Anyway, jump ahead five years or so, and I got really good at my job. Um, I had gotten married, I'd had a baby in all that time. And, um, but there's no advancement to the role of being a nursing unit clerk. There, there's, there was no head nursing unit clerk, right? You, you could make lateral moves, but there was nowhere to go up. Um, and so uh, I thought, oh, what else can I do? Go back to school and learn how to teach the job I was doing. So that's what I decided to do. In other words, I went and got a, a certificate for teaching college and, um, became a college teacher. So I was teaching and working. I was teaching on contract at a college out in the valley. um, And it was medical terminology that I started with. And because I became really, really good at teaching medical terminology, I ended up teaching that for a couple of decades (laughs) in different colleges and different situations. Um, Another college um, invited me to work for them. And I, I went and started teaching the entire program there. But I was still working at the hospital, so that was really good. I was doing the job at the hospital, and then I was teaching about it um, in the other part of my life. So work continued, and then a college with better benefits and better money and all the rest of it, better and and tenure eventually invited me to come and work for them. Um, And all the time that was happening, I had a second baby, and a whole lot of life was going on. And then I got interested in coaching, and I decided to go take training in coaching. And so I went back to school and took training um, on conflict coaching and in something called neuro-linguistic programming. And so after a lot of um, study and practice, I ended up with an associate certification in conflict coaching and then my master practitioner level in neuro-linguistic programming, again, which is the way that our language and the words that we use interacts with our physiology, how the words that we use for it in in talking to ourselves and in talking to others actually those words have an effect on what we think of ourselves and then therefore how we feel about ourselves and therefore how we act and so it's it was a fascinating area of study for me so that was great and I all that was ticking along. My kids were growing up. Life was happening. And uh, and then I ended up working. I moved around the hospital. I did three years in emergency. I worked in the intensive care unit. I worked on a medical cardiac step-down unit. I worked in psychiatry. I worked in extended care. I worked in pediatrics and maternity. And uh, because I would get tired of the same old, same old. And as my kids grew and changed and their needs um, evolved, I wanted to be home more in the day or I wanted to work on the weekends. And anyway, it was a very, very flexible job. So that was great. Um, But I ended up working on the palliative care hospice unit. And that was amazing. It was just, it it felt like such important work to, to walk with people at the end of their life. And at one point, someone came and asked if I would come into a patient room to pray with the family because the chaplain was away and no one else was available. And every once in a while, a nurse would do that who was uh, somebody who was uh, religious or was willing to do that. And um, But that nurse wasn't there that day, so someone came and asked me because they knew I went to church. So I I went in and I, I did that and I thought, wow, I want to be here. I don't want to be sitting behind a desk doing paperwork. I want to be in this place with the, with people in this, you know, incredibly important time of life. Um, so I then took the volunteer chaplain training course at the hospital with the hospital chaplain and did a whole bunch of uh, interacting with patients and families and praying at bedsides. And and then I started taking uh, theology courses through my church. And then they had me doing some leadership from time to time. And that still small voice started to speak and started to get louder and started to bug me and say, Hey, Jen, what are you doing here? <laughs> you should be doing something else. I was like, no. 
So it seemed it was time to go back to school and learn something again, that that was not the end. So I was really resisting it. And I I ended up taking one course at the seminary, which is located at the University of British Columbia, which is about as far away as I could get by transit from where I lived. And I took a course called uh, Permission to Register, which means it's not part of the degree program. They they have a certain number of courses that you can just dip your toe in and take. And then if you keep going at a certain point, they make you choose a track and commit to a degree. And so I took every single course they would let me take without making that commitment because, you know, I was busy. Anyway, um, finally... Finally, they said to me, Jen, you can't take any more courses until you commit to a degree program. And in the meantime, my my marriage of 18 years was ending, all sorts of stuff was going on. And I finally took the leap. I left my position at the hospital. And I took a part time position at a church as a children and youth minister as a student minister. I was still teaching in healthcare, and I started a master's degree program. And and that program took me seven years part time because I couldn't do I was do I was working raising kids doing all sorts of other things. And and during those seven years, I got remarried and gained two stepdaughters. And in 2014, um, I graduated with a master's degree in public and pastoral leadership. And I was ordained as a clergy member in the United Church of Canada and was called to be a minister in a little church that I'm now in on a part-time basis. So... Uh, What a weird trajectory, right? From starting off working uh, in a clerical position in a hospital um, to now I go into bedsides and I sit with people and I walk with people. And, you know, who knew that that's what would happen? So all that to say, (laughs) oh, and then (laughs) in 2015, I was downsized at the college I was teaching at and I decided, you know what? I've been teaching for 23 years by this point. I took everything online, created some online courses, started my coaching practice online, kept doing the podcast, and last summer in 2020, I decided to try my hand at YouTube because, hey, got to learn new things, right? So that's a very long summary of my winding career path. And, and all of that to say that it is sometimes a winding career path that you will be on. And it's perfectly fine to listen for opportunity and to make a move to something new, even if it seems scary or risky or new or like it will take you seven years to realize, <laughs> get to get that piece of paper or get to be in that position that you want to be in, right? Um, it may not happen instantly, but it's possible because I'm living proof that it is. Um, you, you know, so the question is, the question that I have for you is, um, it doesn't, well, it's not even a question. Just because you're good at something, like I was as a nursing unit clerk, uh, doesn't mean, that didn't mean I had to keep doing it for the rest of my life. I was bored and I needed some challenge. And that was at age 24, after I'd been doing it for five years. Because I started there Um, in my seaside hospital when I was 19. Um, And I I needed some challenge and I needed to learn something new. So I went back to to the the teaching, uh, learning how to teach. If this is you and you're listening to this, you can do this two ways. You can find fun and new and interesting things to do outside of the day job or career you already have and that you're in now. If you like it, if it's safe, if it's stable, if it's paying you enough, um, you can add that interest and that learning and that excitement outside your career and your job by learning to do new things that you enjoy and that are fun. You can start a side hustle. You can get yourself on YouTube. You can get yourself started on a podcast. You can uh, you can take up uh, stand-up paddle boarding. I don't know, um, but there are ways that you can add excitement to your life that don't involve making a career move. That's just one option. The other option um, is that you can figure out what you've already gained in knowledge and experience and skill and how that would inform the, the new thing that you might 
be thinking about doing? Do you need to go to school to learn it or learn more about it? Do you need to qualify for it? And what will that take? And how can you do that in a way that fits in with your life, the rest of your life? Or can you teach yourself with online training? Are there things that you can gain and learn and add to your arsenal of knowledge and skill that you can do from home online when, when you have time to? Careers for some people are simple and straightforward and lifelong. And some people I know have always wanted to be X. And so they did. They went and trained and they became X and they were totally satisfied with their choice. And they've lived into it and they've loved it mostly. (laughs) And they've excelled at it and then they retire from it. And wow, that was a fantastic career. And I know lots of people who have done that and are in the midst of still doing that. And that's absolutely wonderful. But that's not the only way. It is very common now to have two, three, even four different careers in a lifetime of working. Just because you're good at something doesn't mean you have to do it for a career. Although maybe you do. And that's great. (laughs) So I guess the whole point of this is don't settle. Don't say stay stuck Um, in something if you're really feeling dissatisfied with it and you're really feeling disappointed because that's where you're going to end up with regret if uh, if you don't step out even if it's scary even if it feels risky and try it and don't ever feel that it's too late (laughs) you know I'm starting YouTube at 53 it's not too late (laughs) and if you need help figuring out any of this, um, please reach out via the careersbygen.com website. I still do have a few coaching spots left in my practice, and I would be happy to book a clarity call, um, a free 30-minute clarity session with you. You can just book that through the website, through the coaching packages that I have um, under online resources on the website And I would be happy to have a a chat with you about what you're struggling with and what you'd like to do next. So thanks for listening, my friend, to this episode. I hope there was something in there for you that was helpful and useful. And if so, please share this with uh, somebody else who might be struggling or wondering if they should do it or if it's too late or or what. Um, So I uh, I hope that you take good care of yourself. And until next time, yeah, keep dreaming. You've been listening to Careers by Jen with Jen Swanson. If you like what you heard, please share this. You know, if every single person listening today shared this episode with just one friend, our audience would be twice as big just like that. And the more people we can help with our content, the better. So help out a friend and help grow our audience by sharing this show with someone you know who would benefit from the content. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that, and together we can make a difference. Until next time, take good care.